I don't care how technically brilliant you are in your field. If you don't understand people, you're going to neutralize all of your powers. Robert Greene. Today, I'm going to summarize another book from Robert Greene titled The Laws of Human Nature. Some people don't like the author and think his books are evil or offensive. I think this is because Robert usually talks about the dark side of human nature that many of us don't dare to talk about or admit that we have dark qualities. Understanding ourselves and the people around us is one of the most important skills we can have in life. After all, we're surrounded by people and we deal with people every day. However, many of us are really bad at this skill. I've personally seen very talented people losing their jobs or facing problems because of bad people skills. This video consists of 18 laws, and I believe it will help you to take your people skills to the next level. By the way, this is one of the longest videos I have ever done, so make sure to save it and watch later. Let's get started. Law number one, the law of envy. My first job was as a salesperson at a small shoe store. My manager was an envious person who used to criticize everyone behind their backs. She also used to flatter me in a way that I felt mocked, and her jokes made everyone uncomfortable as if she was secretly laughing at us. I was relieved when, a couple of months later, I found a better job and left. That same week, I met a coworker of mine by chance, and he asked me if it was true that I'd been fired for stealing money from the cashier. I was shocked as I found out that the manager had spread false rumors about me. Maybe you don't want to admit it, but you compare yourself to others. Some use the comparison as a motivation factor, but others will channel that energy into feelings of envy and jealousy. Most people won't act out their envy, but if someone is sabotaging you or spreading rumors about you, then you're dealing with a dangerously envious person. The signs of envy are obvious. If you want to test someone, tell them good news about yourself and observe their reactions, especially their eyes. People's eyes are going to show hostility even if they are saying wonderful things. You can do the opposite too. Tell them bad news about yourself and watch if micro expressions of happiness show. Just like my manager did. Envious people can make you feel uncomfortable and mocked, even when they're praising you. Gossip is also a sign of envy. Stay as far as possible from envious people. Nothing good can come from them. But if you have no choice, try to deflect envy. To do that, never show off. Open up as little as possible about your life and always try to draw attention away from yourself. Surround yourself with people who are happy for your achievements and who bring positiveness into your life. Now, when you feel envious of someone, remind yourself that what you see is only a part of reality and that other people's lives are as complex as yours with ups and downs too. Also, practice feeling joyful for others so you can turn envy into a source of inspiration and admiration. Law number two, the law of role-playing. A few months ago, a friend of mine asked me for help. He was in a long-term relationship with a French girl and wanted to propose, but he admitted to his biggest fear. I'll have to travel to Paris and meet her parents. Her father is a very difficult person and I think he hates me. My friend planned to collect some information about his future father-in-law, and he wanted my help to practice possible difficult conversations to make sure this encounter happened as softly as possible. I'm sure you can relate to wanting to show a better version of who you are. Maybe it was a business meeting, a job interview, or even a family party. We rarely show the world the person we are deep inside. It's like we're wearing a theater mask, and we have one for each situation in our lives. We are different at work than we are with our family or with our friends. The reason we do that is we need to get along with people and many of our real feelings and traits would make that difficult or even impossible. A person who can't hide or who says exactly what they think all the time is going to be unpleasant and unwanted, if not hated. If you are lucky, you can be more authentic in your close relationships, but that's not true for most social situations, especially at work. If you ignore this law, you're wasting a huge opportunity to develop your social skills. Here are two tips to use this knowledge to your advantage. Tip number one, accept that those masks are necessary so that you can function socially and wear yours proudly. You're not being unethical. You're doing exactly what is expected of you. Tip number two, 
There are very small cracks in our masks and our true personalities leak out sometimes. You can observe people and learn more about them. Children are amazing observers. That's why liars hate them so much. All you need to do is to recover that ability. Focus on their faces, micro expressions, signs of tension, forced smiles. Focus on how they inflect their voices and how fast or slow they speak. Just don't be too obvious or people might get defensive. Law number three, the law of compulsive behavior. Do you have a friend who always falls in love with the wrong person? They promise themselves next time will be different, but are heartbroken again in a few months. I used to have a friend who always offended people unintentionally. He regretted it and apologized, only to find himself doing it again later. Our behavior patterns are influenced by a deep part of our personalities called character. Character stays with us for our whole lives, so it's easier to see it when you analyze people's actions over time. Remember, people never do something just once. They will repeat their good and bad behavior, and sometimes they don't even know they're doing things until it's too late. So here's how to use your knowledge about character to improve your relationships. Tip number one, pay attention to people's behavior patterns. How do they make decisions and solve problems? Most importantly, how do they deal with power, responsibility, and pressure? People become more vulnerable and less flexible when they're stressed. That's when they show who they really are. Tip number two, value character above all else when choosing people to relate to. When choosing a partner, for example, character should be more important than charm and attraction. This is how you avoid wasting years of your life with an incompatible person and a toxic relationship. Choose to relate to people who are strong, flexible, empathetic, and persistent. Tip number three, avoid toxic character types. Here are a few ones that you should be especially careful with. The hyper-perfectionist. They seem dedicated, but are more concerned about being in control than about good results. The relentless rebel. They hate authority, rules, and can't accept criticism. Their rebel instinct is going to turn against you sooner or later. The personalizer. They are sensitive and take everything personally. You walk on eggshells not to hurt them and feel guilty for insulting them, even if you didn't. The big talker. They seem impressive, but once you get to know them better, you'll find out that they're actually boasting about things they've never done or will never do. The pampered prince or princess. These people behave childishly and make you feel bad for not giving them everything they want. The savior. They'll always be there for you, giving you everything you need and solving your problem. Until you try to be independent and realize they were just trying to buy and control you. Law number four, the law of covetousness. If you have ever observed small children playing together, you'll notice an interesting behavior. When one of them catches a toy to play with, the other children suddenly want it too. And if you tell them they can have any toy they want except one, guess which toy they will throw a tantrum to get. From a very early age, people desire to have what they don't or can't get. The behavior repeats itself. We get what we want and immediately lose interest and find a new object to covet. Nothing kills our imagination faster than familiarity and predictability. Sometimes we just move on from one object to the other, getting easily bored with everything we already have, including our relationships. Humans can't stop coveting, but we can learn how to use it in our favor. Here are three ways to do it. Tip number one, find out what you want. Identify what is positive and what is counterproductive in your coveting tendencies. Don't allow yourself to be easily deceived and covet something just because that's what everyone else wants. Think of all the negative points too. A lot of people desire fame, for example, but are they really prepared to deal with the lack of privacy and freedom fame brings? Tip number two, find enjoyment in your reality. Focus on the positive side and be grateful for what you have today. Being in a deeper relationship with your reality will give you the focus and power to change only what really needs to be changed. Tip number three, becoming an elusive object of desire. Honesty and authenticity are positive traits, but when exaggerated, you can become boring and predictable and other people's attention will soon move forward to someone else. Instead of focusing on the things you covet, Focus on other people's fantasies and unfulfilled desires and become what they desire. The rest will come. 
Look at yourself from the outside. How do people see you and your work? Once you know, shape their perceptions and convey the exact image you want. You might want to associate your image or your work image with something forbidden or secret because it will spike their curiosity and make you more appealing. Don't be always available and create the impression that everyone wants to have your work. Just like children fighting for a toy, people will want it if they believe other people want it too. Law number five, the law of repression. Have you ever felt like doing something so horrible that it shocked you that it even crossed your mind? If you tell me bad actions never cross your mind, then I'll tell you it's because you've been repressing your shadow. A shadow is the side of us we hide even from ourselves because we don't want to admit having them. Your shadow contains your worst insecurities, your most terrible secrets and desires, your aggressive and selfish tendencies. Sometimes when you feel too stressed, vulnerable, or anxious, small parts of this side leak out. That's when we show contradictory or accidental behavior and emotional outbursts, for example. Most of us try to hide our shadows, but this is not the right thing to do. The more we deny our shadow, the stronger it becomes. This happens culturally too. The more prohibitive a culture is, the more attracted people will feel to the shadow aspects. That's the reason stories about serial killers, cruel villains, and extreme violence are so popular. Also, people who only project perfection are perceived as fake and unauthentic. That's because they're repressing a part of who they are. We are more attracted to people who embrace their shadow because all of us can relate to imperfection. Here's how to do it. See the shadow. Pay attention to the part of you that you show the world. Are you always cheerful and excited? Always patient and calm? You might be hiding the opposite of that. Also, if you've been oversensitive or overaggressive, imagine what triggered those reactions to know yourself deeper. Embrace the shadow. Once you find out the parts of you that are hidden, don't ignore them. Admitting to your flaws will make you relatable and likable. Explore your shadow. Play with your previously hidden thoughts and feelings and channel that energy into your work or hobby, especially creative work. Show the shadow. Allow yourself to be more assertive, indifferent, weird, or selfish. You'll notice that a lot of successful people are eccentric or unconventional. That's because people have more chances to become successful when they embrace their shadows. Law number six, the law of narcissism. Carl considered Mabel his best friend. They were always together, doing all the interesting things that Mabel loved to do. But one day, Carl was afraid to lose Mabel. He'd received some bad news about the death of a family member. To cheer him up, Mabel bought movie tickets for them. Carl was very sad, though, and told her he would rather stay home. Mabel didn't reply to his texts for a week after that. Carl was already worried when Mabel replied, telling him she didn't have money to pay for her electricity bill, since she had spent a lot on those movie tickets, and still he refused to go with her. Carl felt terrible apologized and offered to pay her electricity bill for her. Mabel is what we call a deep narcissist. She was used to having power over Carl and getting attention from him. When he took an independent step instead of doing what she wanted, Mabel found a way to punish him for it, the silent treatment. She ignored the way he felt and took his refusal to go to the movies as a personal attack. So hurt she was, she made sure he felt guilty about it and made up for it. People like Mabel feel they're in high danger if they're not receiving love and attention from outside all the time. And they have no limits as to how far they would go to get such attention. They're so manipulative that it's hard to realize what they're doing, just like Carl didn't. Now, you and I are not so different from Mabel. All of us are narcissists at some level. We focus on our goals and feelings most of the time and want to be appreciated. The difference is that most of us can do something Mabel can't. We can give ourselves love and attention. Therefore, we don't need external validation all the time, as she does. The opposite of narcissism is empathy. It's when we forget about ourselves and turn our attention to others. The more empathetic we are, the healthier we will be. Empathetic people recover quickly when they're hurt, don't take things personally, and can laugh at themselves. They also understand people better and build healthier relationships. Law number seven, the law of irrationality. Katie and Jen work together. They're not best friends, but they get along well enough. 
Well, that is, they used to until last week when Jen shouted at Katie for making a mistake on her report. I always have to correct all your reports. Can't you do it right at least once? Katie's now hurt, and she thinks Jen overreacted because her mistake was very small. Jen, on the other hand, knows she was harsh at Katie, but she was so fed up. Also, she doesn't want to admit that the anger she felt is more related to her being emotional because of her divorce than to Katie's faulty reports. I'm sure you've experienced a similar situation before. Someone overreacted and you suffered the consequences, or maybe you were the one overreacting. This happens because you can't think rationally all the time. Sometimes you are dominated by emotions and end up making bad decisions. Emotions are not bad things, they are necessary. The problem is that our emotions are guided by a very simple principle. We are always trying to avoid pain and find pleasure. This means that even when we know what the right thing to do is, doing it is not easy if it's painful. We'll make up excuses. And that's why most people will never admit they're wrong or change their minds. Because being wrong and changing are painful things. Now, the consequences of being irrational can be terrible. So here are four tips to become more rational. Number one, accept you're irrational. A person who thinks they're always rational believes they're right all the time. They will simply react and end up being led by their own failed interpretation of their emotions, events, and other people. Number two, examine reactions. By analyzing your behavior, you slowly build up your knowledge about yourself. This knowledge will help your rational side take control when you face similar situations again. Number three, increase reaction time. Have you ever come up with the perfect comeback as soon as you felt calmer after an argument with someone? Removing yourself from the situation and giving yourself some time to calm down can help you step back into your rational self. Remember, our true colors show up when we're under pressure. This is the best opportunity to observe who other people really are. Four, accept pain. We should increase our pain tolerance. It's okay to be wrong, to feel hurt, to feel guilty. Embrace your feelings, both the pleasurable and the uncomfortable ones, and they'll have less power over you. Law number eight, the law of short-sightedness. This law is what prevents you from being successful in your diets, in developing good long-term habits, and in eliminating bad habits. If we could always focus long-term, it would be easy for us to never eat sugar, for example, because we would always remember it's bad for our health. But it's not easy to think about that if you have a huge piece of chocolate cake right in front of you, is it? People usually react to present circumstances and forget that most things are temporary and that they have consequences. It's like you're near the base of a mountain and can't see much because you're surrounded by a dense forest. As you climb up though, your perspective expands. When you're at the top, you'll see better than anyone else. So how can you climb that mountain and see the big picture? Here are four tips. Tip number one. In the 19th century, the authorities decided that there were too many poisonous snakes in Delhi and offered a reward to everyone that brought them a dead snake. Some people started breeding snakes so they could kill them and receive the rewards. The authorities realized their mistake and removed the reward, but people now had no idea what to do with the snakes they had. They let them go, and as a result, there were even more snakes in Delhi than before. Sometimes our actions bring unwanted consequences. To prevent this problem, try to foresee all the possible consequences of taking certain action, even if they sound obvious. Ask yourself how you can deal with each of them. Tip number two, sometimes you have invested so much of your energy in a conflict that you refuse to let go, even when you know you should. Step back and ask yourself, what are my real priorities? If I win this fight, will it help me reach my goals? Some battles are just not worth it. Tip number three, when you make an online purchase, I'm sure you want to receive it as fast as possible, right? As time goes by, we get more and more impatient. We need to work on our patience and establish long-term goals if we want to succeed. Tip number four, nowadays information is everywhere and with so many accessible details, it's hard to see the big picture. You need to train your mind to filter the essential things based on your priorities and goals. Number nine, the law of defensiveness. 
To illustrate this law, the author tells the story of a rebellious teenager who was caught red-handed selling drugs at school. He was immediately suspended, but he still had to do his homework. He obviously didn't want to study, so his mother had an idea. She told him, The principal doesn't allow you to go to class because he wants you to fail. He thinks students can't learn from home. He'd feel terrible if you proved him wrong. Of course, this had the exact effect his mother wanted. In order to take revenge on the principal, the boy had more energy to study than ever before. All of us like to believe we have three qualities. Autonomous. We'll always deny being influenced by others and rebel if we feel someone is trying to change or persuade us. Intelligent. Most of us accept we're not modern versions of Einstein, but we still believe we have our own kind of intelligence. Good. We believe we are good people and support the right causes. The first strategy for becoming a master persuader is to never put someone in a situation that threatens one of these three beliefs. Work inside their self-opinion, even if it's not a positive or realistic one. Be empathetic and validate people's beliefs before you try to persuade them. Let them feel like they're persuading you. They'll feel superior, which is precisely what you want because then they'll be more open to your ideas. Strategy number two, be a deep listener. Listen more than you speak. Reply to what they said with something that makes them feel validated and that encourages them to keep talking about their interests. But don't be too obvious because they'll get defensive if it sounds like an interview rather than a conversation. Strategy number three, inspire safety. When we believe people accept us and love us just the way we are, we feel less defensive. When we are with friends, for example, your goal is to learn how to inspire the same feeling of security in other people. Strategy number four, allay their insecurities. We tend to like people who can appreciate us. So identify their insecurities and never trigger any of them. When someone asks you for your opinion, they don't want the truth. They don't want to lie either. What they want is to be validated and to have their opinion confirmed, but in the most realistic and kind way possible. Strategy number five, use people's resistance and stubbornness. Some people are especially resistant. They feel like the world is against them, so they need to resist it. Your job is to use their resistance and stubbornness back at them, like the mother did with her rebellious son. Law number 10, the law of self-sabotage. Suppose two people travel to Paris, Marcus and Lydia. Marcus thinks Paris doesn't look so appealing. The language is difficult, so he doesn't talk to a lot of people because he hates embarrassing himself. The beautiful pictures he's seen don't correspond to reality because the sites are always crowded with tourists. He feels lonely and uncomfortable. When he goes back home, he tells people that Paris is not worth it. Lydia, on the other hand, is delighted. Even though her French isn't great, she wants to meet new people. Sometimes they make fun of her, but she laughs at herself and keeps on trying. She ends up making friends who tell her about the best days to visit the sites so she can take the best pictures. She has plans to come visit again soon. As you can see, even though two people might share the same experience, a different attitude and perspective can change how it affects both of them. Some people have a negative and narrow attitude. They are too careful, afraid to lose control, and always expect the worst to happen, just like Marcus. Other people like Lydia are always open to new ideas and they usually have more positive experiences. Here are a few expansive attitudes that can help you. Attitude number one, replace conviction with curiosity and see yourself as a fearless and open-minded explorer. Attitude number two, don't try to avoid frustration and obstacles at any cost. You can't avoid adversities, but you can control your responses to them. See negative events as opportunities to learn and become stronger. Attitude number three, don't adopt the indifferent and skeptical attitude that's so in fashion right now. These people see positive people as naive, but their negativity is actually a mask to disguise their fears. Attitude number four, don't take things personally. Most times people's reactions towards you say nothing about you, it's about themselves. Attitude number five, don't limit yourself. Your body and mind can do much more than you think. When I was still in college, I often got sick before a difficult test or an important presentation. 
This happens because negative feelings such as exhaustion or anxiety make us weaker. Our health improves when we are more positive. Law number 11, the law of grandiosity. We've all dreamed of something grandiose before, especially when we were children. We dream we will be the most popular rock star, write the next bestseller, save all animals from extinction, or run the most successful business in the world. We want to consider ourselves important and have a positive opinion about ourselves. This isn't a bad thing. Grandiose dreams move us and give us willpower and motivation. The problem is when our grandiosity feelings get out of control and lead us to a distorted version of reality. We start to believe we are much greater than we are or than everyone else thinks we are, and we lose touch with reality. To avoid that, we need to channel that grandiose energy to our work, goals, and decisions, not to our egos. This is how you can do that and feel fulfilled. Tip number one, be honest with yourself. We all have ambitions and want to feel important. What is it you want and is it doable? Tip number two, instead of hopping from project to project, unable to decide which fantastic idea is best, focus on one reasonable goal only and take one step at a time. Tip number three, your ideas won't be perfect. Search for other people's feedback about it and consider their opinions. Tip number four, go for projects that are a little above your current skill level. Not below, because they'll be too easy. Not at the same level, because they won't make you grow. And not too above, because they'll be a fantasy and you'll give up on it as soon as you realize that. Tip number five, once you've tamed this energy, you can let it run free from time to time by challenging yourself with a greater goal. Law number 12, the law of gender rigidity. In many ancient cultures, such as Persians and Egyptians, it was believed that humans were both male and female. The myth said it made them so powerful that the gods felt insecure and split humans in half, and that's how we became either masculine or feminine. Green says that all of us have masculine and feminine qualities, but as we grow, we over-identify with one or the other based on our genetics and the influence of our parents. So we repress our other qualities, and in the process, we lose important dimensions of our character and personality. One example of this is when you see a person who believes rationality is an exclusive masculine feature. They will belittle men who are more emotional and say things such as, boys don't cry, even though it's proved that men can be as or even more emotional than girls. We must become comfortable with both our masculine and feminine qualities and cultivate balance. When we cover that distance internally, our external relationships will improve because we'll feel more connected to all human beings, regardless of gender identification. To make progress individually and as a society, we should stop trying to fit in. Don't conform to the gender role that is expected of you, nor demand that from others, especially from children. Instead, create a role that fits you and who you are, regardless of gender features. Look inside of you, become aware of the masculine or feminine traits you've lost along the way, and gradually reconnect with them. You'll become more creative, authentic, and independent. Law number 13, the law of aimlessness. I've already heard about many people who achieved their goal to be rich, but suddenly felt lost. Somehow the money they had worked so hard for didn't seem to fill the gap the way they expected it would. We hear countless stories, some of them very tragic, of people who are rich, famous, and successful, but not happy. This happens because things like money and fame have no meaning if they're not connected to a higher purpose. They're just stuff that you'll always want more of. Without a purpose, your goals won't bring you fulfillment. Instead, they'll be easily replaced by new meaningless goals as soon as you achieve them. You'll feel lost and think, I got what I wanted. Why am I not happy? What have I been doing with my life, in this job, in this city? Here are a few strategies to help you find your high sense of purpose. Discover your calling in life. Search for inclinations you've had since you were a child, activities that seemed pleasurable, natural, and easy. Is there anything you love to do so much that you would even do it for free? Your vocation might be related to the intersection between several fields, such as technology and design, or literature and philosophy, for example. 
Embrace people's negative opinions. Most people avoid situations where they will face criticism and failure. You don't need to do that. Accept negative experiences, limitations, and even suffering as ways to learn and use other people's negative opinions to motivate you and increase your sense of purpose. Absorb purposeful energy. We are extremely sensitive to other people's moods and energy. Always try to associate with people who have a high sense of purpose because they will inspire the best in you. Create a ladder of descending goals. Long-term goals will give you clarity and determination. They are ambitious and motivate you. Problem is that they also bring anxiety. To deal with this, you need to create a ladder of smaller, simpler goals that lead to your greater one. Think of goals that you can achieve in relatively short periods so you can feel satisfaction and be reminded of your sense of purpose from time to time. Law number 14, the law of conformity. In the 1950s, psychologist Solomon Ash made a group experiment. He showed participants one line segment and then three more and asked them to choose which of the three lines matched the length of the first one. When Solomon asked the participants individually, they would often choose the correct line. But when asked in the presence of other people who were told to intentionally select the wrong line, around 75% of participants chose the line the rest of the group had chosen. There are countless examples of conformity in our lives. The way we dress, the foods we eat, and the brands we buy are heavily influenced by our social groups. We don't conform because we're naive or easy to manipulate, but because we need to feel we belong, be it in a small group, such as our group of friends, or in a larger one, such as the country we live in. The only problem is that to be able to fit in, we are willing to ignore our rational side, so we get more prone to taking unnecessary risks. Since we can't avoid conformity, we need to find out the things that can trigger this irrational response in us so we can still belong and cooperate while keeping our independence and rationality. To do that, Green suggests we form a reality group. The idea is to use this social force with a positive purpose, to create something great together. Here's how. Tip number one, keep your focus on the ideas, not on the people that have them, and instruct your group to do the same. Number two, establish a group a positive mission that draws the members of the group together and state it clearly so everyone knows where you're trying to go. Tip number three, use your mental energy to do the essential things and don't be afraid to delegate to people you trust. Number four, encourage communication and let information and ideas flow freely. The more information you have, the better decisions you'll make. Tip number five, people are sensitive to your emotions, especially if you are the leader. Make sure you're bringing the right emotions to the group. Confidence, tranquility, and determination. Law number 15, the law of fickleness. Human beings are ambivalent about leadership. We want to be guided, but we also want to make decisions. We want to be protected, but we also want to be free. When you're a leader, people will always be prepared to turn their backs on you as soon as you mess up. So here are six strategies to lead better and establish authority. Authenticity. The authority you want to establish must emerge naturally from your character. There are so many types of leaders and you should do you. Attitude. Be a good listener. Focus on helping and serving others instead of yourself. And remember, being a leader is a huge responsibility, not a privilege. Vision. In difficult times, be the person who can see beyond fear and stress and bring everyone back to focus. Tone. Work as hard or harder than your team. Lead by example, and members will automatically want to rise to your level. Taboo. Give more than you take. If you take too much, you can create a sense of insecurity that will lead people to question your authority. Adaptability. As you inspire confidence and respect, your authority grows, but with time, people might see you as old-fashioned and outdated. You always need to find ways to adapt your leadership style to the new times. Law number 16, the law of aggression. Aggression has always been a tool we use to defend ourselves from danger and to fight for the things we need, such as food and shelter. Nowadays, we hardly ever need to hunt, fight against animals, or dispute a cave but our aggressive impulses still play a role in our lives. Beneath our masks, 
we are all dealing with aggression. We feel insecure or vulnerable as if we were in danger, so we get aggressive. That's when we end up saying and doing things that we later regret. Here are a few tips to deal with aggression. Tip number one, recognize your patterns. You need to know where you're channeling your aggression so you can make a conscious change. Tip number two, don't hold it in. Aggression is like pressure. If you don't let it out somehow, it'll blow up and hurt you. Tip number three, admit to your ambitions and use them to grow and improve. Tip number four, ignore your self-doubt and be persistent. Tip number five, turn your aggression at the problems you need to solve, but don't let it out on the people involved. It doesn't matter if you think they deserve it or not. Law number 17, the law of generational myopia. One of the things that most amazed me in the stories my parents and grandparents used to tell me is that back then, social roles were clearly defined and very fixed. There were very clear rules about what people were expected to do and no one questioned any of that. These aspects are very different from the way families and societies organize nowadays and the way we deal with differences, aren't they? Every generation is a mix of the beliefs and ideas from their parents and the need to separate themselves from the previous generation. This mix creates a zeitgeist, a spirit of the times, formed by certain tastes, beliefs, battles, and ways of thinking. You internalize those influences as much as anyone else. We are all products of our time. You should understand the power your generation spirit has on you, so you can be more independent from the restrictions that come with it. If you identify what your generation is searching for and give it a voice, there's a great chance that your work will find resonance. Here are five strategies to make it happen. Challenge your past. Maybe you want to create something new, but you feel strained by the values you've been raised with. It's normal to hesitate, but don't be afraid to express the taboos of your generation. Adapt the past to the spirit of the present. The frustrations of your generation have certainly been felt before by a different generation. Who were the leaders then? What did they do? Adapt some of their styles and symbols to your reality. Relive the childhood spirit. By capturing the spirit of your childhood, you will reach everyone who experienced those moments and your generational peers will want to follow you. Subvert the spirit. Maybe you are in conflict with part of the spirit of your generation. Be creative and find a soft way to deviate it instead of fighting it. Keep on adapting. As we get older, we tend to remain stuck to our values, ideas, and styles. Improve your flexibility by surrounding yourself with people of different generations. As you pay close attention to their values, ideas, and perspectives, you expand your own. Law number 18, the law of death denial. Have you ever had months to work on a school paper and ended up doing it at the last week or even on the last day before the deadline? You put it off and only felt motivated to work efficiently when the deadline approached. That's very similar to how we feel about death. We are going to die someday, and that is going to be our deadline. The idea of death makes us anxious, so we deny it as much as possible. But by repressing the idea of death, we pretend we don't have a deadline and we put things off. Instead of cherishing life, we waste our days as if we had all the time in the world. If you are 30 years old right now, it means you have 30 more really productive years left. After the age of 60, most people don't have much power and passion left to do the things they want to do. That is why I think it's fair to say that the real productive years left are 30. Of those 30 years, you will spend eight years in sleep. Two years will be spent on traveling, such as going to work, church, traveling to meet friends, etc. You will spend on average three years taking care of yourself, showering, cleaning, etc. Let's say you'll spend another two years on entertainment and having fun. If you deduct all that from the total 30 years, you will see that you only have 15 years left to be really productive and do the things you want to do. 15 years isn't a long time. It feels like it was yesterday we entered 2021, but now 2021 and 2022 are over and we are in 2023. Just like that, 2023 will also pass very quickly. Life is really short, and remembering that you will die is going to help you to prioritize doing the things you want to do in life. We will live fuller lives if we connect to the reality of death. 
Think of your remaining years as your deadline and use it as a motivation to work on what matters most to you and on all the amazing experiences you can have before death arrives. If you like Robert Greene's ideas, check out the video you see on the screen. It's the summary of another book called The 48 Laws of Power. Thanks for watching.